World War II had a lot of aircraft. A lot of different aircraft. And some of them got just a little bit. Just a, just a little bit. Big chunkus. Now, I kind of rattled my brain in terms of how best to break a list like this down. And I decided to go by weight instead of, like, wingspan. Because some aircraft actually have longer wingspans, but way less than others with shorter wingspans. It's weird. It, it depends on a lot of different factors. So I figured I'd go by heaviest. And I also want to clear something up. This isn't necessarily a de facto list of these are absolutely the top five heaviest aircraft of the war. That is a bit harder to narrow down. So I might have missed some. Also, I did not include weird experimental stuff. Um, because... There were some pretty big experimental units as well, but I decided to go with aircraft that did technically enter service, even if they were in small numbers. So with that, these are five of the heaviest, not the, five of the heaviest planes from World War II. The Messerschmitt ME-323. Gigant, which means giant, because, yeah. This was a military transport aircraft, and it was actually the largest land-based transport aircraft to fly during the war. And the roots of this aircraft actually have to do with an unpowered glider, known as the ME-321. Those gliders were designed to help Germany mount an invasion across the English Channel. They were meant to be able to carry very heavy things and, well, land in the UK and then tanks would roll out. That's... that's how they were supposed to work. Ultimately, the 261 never actually got to do that for a variety of reasons, but it was later developed into a powered version, the ME-323. These things were huge, and to actually reduce weight as well as save aluminum, much of their wings was made of plywood and fabric. Their maximum payload was actually around 12 tons, though at that weight, they couldn't even get off the ground without rocket-assisted takeoffs. While they did wind up using them, they were always pretty underpowered. They were slow, cumbersome, and, I mean, they were transports, yeah, but even in that role, they weren't so great. But they were still integral to the German war effort, as they could carry around things that no other plane they had could. But how heavy were they? Well... I'm gonna go by maximum takeoff weight, as it's the heaviest they could be and still get off the ground. Though, as I stressed, at this weight they would need rocket assistance to do it. But the max takeoff weight for these things is 430,000 kilograms, or 94,799 pounds. A massive aircraft for the times, and in the modern day, technically no complete aircraft survives. Well, sort of. In Berlin, they have a main wing spar in the Air Force Museum of the German Federal Armed Forces. But in 2012, a ruined but intact wreck was found in the sea near La Maddalena, which is an island near Sardinia, Italy. That particular aircraft is underneath about 200 feet of water, 8 nautical miles from the coast. It had actually been shot down by a Bristol bow fighter. It hasn't been raised as of the making of this video, but it would be an interesting project to see, since that would be an extremely unique piece for a museum. The Boeing 314 Clipper. Now, some more in the know people are going to come at me for including this, because this, um, well, isn't a warplane, technically. This was designed as a passenger aircraft, initially requested by Pan American, who were looking for a Trans-Pacific flying boat. Boeing would eventually deliver the Clipper, and it first flew on June 7th, 1938. They carried a tremendous amount of fuel in order to actually get over the Pacific, which makes sense, and they were designed for one class, luxury air travel. These things were fancy. Pan Am scheduled them to travel from San Francisco to Honolulu in just 19 hours with a cruising speed of 188 miles per hour, which was pretty quick in those days. They catered these aircraft to elite businessmen and the wealthy travelers. They performed extremely well, but we're talking about World War II. Well, given the fact that they were large and capable of transporting a tremendous amount of stuff, and people for that matter, 
Pan Am's clipper fleet was eventually pressed into U.S. military service. The aircraft were used for ferrying personnel and equipment to the European and Pacific Front. The planes were purchased by the War and Navy Departments and leased back to Pan Am later for a dollar. But this arrangement had a catch in that all would be operated by the Navy once four engine replacements for the Army's four clippers were actually in service. And the planes actually continued to be flown by the civilian crews, as they had much more experience with the aircraft. Once the war was over, most of the planes were returned to Pan American. But the problem was, by that time, the Clipper had become obsolete. The Clipper was a flying boat, and at the time of their introduction, they had the advantage of not needing the long concrete runways. But during the war, a ton of those runways had been built for heavy bombers. Other long-range airliners were being introduced, like the Lockheed Constellation and the Douglas DC-4s. And the thing about land-based planes is that they didn't require as much training to fly. Landing on water requires a whole bunch of extra education for pilots and crews to know. Even one of the most experienced pilots of the Clipper said that he had personally argued for transitioning to DC-4s instead, because land planes were just straight-up safer. None of the original 12 Clippers survived. Every single one was destroyed in various ways, but there is a replica, a mock-up, at the Foynes Flying Boat Museum in Ireland. Additionally, there are actually plans by an organization called Underwater Admiralty Sciences to recover two sunken 314s. One was scuttled in the Pacific Ocean, the other was sunk by the Coast Guard in the Atlantic. But as of the making of this video, nothing has really come of those plans. Oh, yeah, I guess you're probably wondering, wait, this is about weight, how heavy were they? Okay, fine. Gross weight was 84,000 pounds, 38,102 kilograms. That's gross weight, mind you. And yes, it is higher than the gross weight of the Gigant, which was 65,036 pounds. While the max takeoff weight of the Gigant is listed as being higher, that was with rocket assistance. And that's cheating! You can't cheat your way above the 314, Gigant. The La Tecoe 521? La Tecoe? La te I, 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 it's French. It's French. I don't know how to pronounce it. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll get yelled at. I'm just going to call it the 521. This is another flying boat that, much like the Clipper, was not actually built to be a military aircraft, but still wound up being that. It was a double-deck flying boat. And at the time of work, their max takeoff weight, just so we're clear, was 88,185 pounds. 40,000 kilograms. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress is also the only plane on this list that is not a transport. This is a very famous bomber. I'm sure plenty of you already know what a B-29 is. It was one of the most successful heavy bombers of the war and was designed for high altitude strategic bombing, though could actually do low altitude work as well, and is credited with dropping the atomic bombs on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The B-29 is the only aircraft to ever drop nuclear weapons in combat. They were indeed one of the largest aircraft of the war, and developing them was... it, it was a lot. They had state-of-the-art technology, like a pressurized cabin, dual-wheeled tricycle landing gear, an analog computer-controlled fire control system, which allowed a single gunner and a fire control officer to direct four remote machine gun turrets. Getting these things in the air cost America three billion dollars, which is about 50 billion now, and it actually cost more than the Manhattan Project that built the atomic bombs in the first place. It was cheaper to make the A-bomb than it was to make the B-29 that dropped it. The B-29 is in fact the most expensive program of the entire war, but it was worth it. They were good planes and helped finish the fight against the Axis powers. To date, 20 B-29s are on static display, and two, Fifi and Doc, are actually in flying condition for air shows. As you can imagine, being one of the largest aircraft of the war and being bombers, yeah, they, they, they were pretty heavy. They weighed a lot. 
they weighed a lot. Their maximum takeoff weight was 133,500 pounds, 60,555 kilograms. Mind you, that's the listed takeoff weight. The combat overload weight was 135,000 pounds. They could carry a lot if they really had to. Just so we're clear, the gross weight was 120,000 pounds. These things are big, but very successful, and greatly influenced a lot of future aircraft manufacturing, both military and civilian. The Martin JRM Mars. This four-engined cargo transport flying boat was designed and built by the Martin Company for the U.S. Navy. They were built for the war. And it was the largest Allied flying boat to actually enter production, though they only ever made seven of them. During the conflict, they flew record amounts of naval cargo on the San Francisco-Honolulu route, and actually continued to do that even after the war. They were tremendously good planes because they could carry just so so much weight. How much weight are we talking with these things? Well, the gross weight was actually only about 90,000 pounds, and their empty weight was 75,573 pounds. They were actually lighter than the B-29. But their maximum takeoff weight, the heaviest they could possibly be, was 165,000 pounds. 74,843 kilograms. Big chungus and their ability to carry just just so much meant that they continued to operate even after the war was over and then fell into civilian hands see in 1959 the remaining four aircraft were sold for scrap but a canadian company forest industries flying tankers or fift was actually put together and bid on them the company actually represented a consortium of british columbia forest companies and they won. They got the aircraft. They were flown to Ferry Aviation at Victoria, British Columbia for conversion. They weren't to be transports anymore. They were to be water bombers. The company was well aware these planes could hold a lot of weight. And the idea was, well, what if we made them carry water and drop the water on large amounts of fire? Forest fires are a problem over in British Columbia. They do happen. And the thought was, well, if we could convert these things into water bombers, that could help control the forest fires. And indeed, they were given tanks in their cargo bay with retractable pickup scoops to allow them to actually fill the tanks while the aircraft was taxiing because, well, they were flying boats. It was actually a pretty ingenious concept. Over the years, a few more of the planes were lost, however. Marianas Mars crashed on June 23rd, 1961 during firefighting operations and all four crew members were killed. And just over a year later, one of her sisters, Caroline Mars, was damaged beyond repair by a typhoon named Frida. The typhoon had actually blown her 200 yards and broke her back. But Hawaii Mars and Philippine Mars were still around and entered service in 1963. They served in that capacity for many, many years. Way longer than you'd expect a World War II plane to continue to be useful. On November 10, 2006, Timber West Forest announced they were looking for buyers of the Mars. Both were sold to Coulson Forest Products, another forestry company. However, in 2012, Coulson announced that Philippine Mars, due to the fact she hadn't done anything for about five years at that point, would actually be retired. But she was going to be flown to the National Naval Aviation Museum at Naval Air Station Pensacola, Florida, for static display. She was repainted to her original U.S. Navy colors, and after the 2013 season, British Columbia's provincial government announced that Hawaii Mars would no longer be placed on contract due to the fact that she just hadn't been used to fight any fires for about two years, and the operation of newer aircraft had superseded her. Coulson looked for buyers, but none came forward. However, as of June of 2023, plans are being finalized for her to be transferred to the British Columbia Aviation Museum. She, like her sister Philippine, will be put on static display after long and fruitful careers. I'd say at this point that the last of the Mars sisters definitely deserves it. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, 
Jack Carson's Road videos. Lord Off 44, A Person 723, Row Hudson 2060, Isafer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Cross White, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Zelinski, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Amtrak 2024 Productions, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, Dr. Racer 78, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, Battle 604, Hannah Bird, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.